imprisonment, the false claims, the false charges against him that landed him in prison. We learned a, about the real reason that God allowed the imprisonment to take place. We learned about who was really in charge of the imprisonment. Today we want to revisit our text and we're going to focus on Paul the pioneer. Specifically we're going to look at his ministry, the mystery, and the message that he was given. Will you stand as we honor the Lord in the reading of his word, Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1, down through verse number 7. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto uh, his holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Father God, we join our hearts together and humble ourselves before you. Lord, you are a God that has loved us when we were unlovable. You saved us, washed us, and made us clean when we were dirty and filthy and distant. You have given us your word to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So God, I ask this morning that you would use me, certainly a broken vessel, but use me as a vessel fit for your use today to bring forth the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to share your words, that it might penetrate the hearts of the listeners, that it might speak to the very depths of their soul, that we might be able to leave here today rejoicing that one, we've been in your presence, but more importantly, that we felt your work in our individual hearts. So God, give me the words that you would have me to preach. And help me to preach it for your glory and honor. And for the edification, the education, the improvement, and the building up of the saints. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the sermon last Sunday, we focused primarily on verse number one, or exclusively, really. In that verse, Paul reminds his readers that he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. As I said, we discovered that he was imprisoned on false charges. I think that part of the outline uh, should be what you received today. I gave you just a few bullet points from last week's sermon. But Paul was imprisoned on false charges. They said that he had taken a, a Gentile in the private parts of the temple, which was untrue. But nonetheless, that was the charges that the Jews put uh, against him. Uh, because he was um, of Roman citizenship, they couldn't just whip him and, and beat him like they wanted to do. Uh, so he was held in prison for a couple years. Then he was transported on to Rome uh, that trip took about a year, and then when he got to Rome, it was another two years there in prison. So there's about a five-year period in his life where he's in prison. So he's imprisoned on false charges. Um, God uses that time, just like God will put you on the shelf from time to time. I've been put on the shelf in the course of my ministry where God says, I have a different plan for you than you have for yourself. And isn't it great to know that God is in of our life, even when he redirects what we're doing, he's doing it for our good and his purpose. And Paul found that to be true, and God, Paul understood God was in control of his imprisonment. God controls our life. If you don't get much of anything else, 
else I say, understand if you are a child of the king, he is in control of your life. Paul understood that he was under the direct, sovereign control of the Lord Jesus. And I want you to understand that you have a choice. You can listen to what man says to you. You can allow what situations you may be facing to control your life, to control your attitude, to control your responses, or you can say, you know what, I'm going to throw all that aside and just understand that God's controlling things. We need to learn to come to the same place that Paul was where he said God is in control. The Jews thought they had him in prison. The Jews really couldn't imprison him unless God allowed it. Uh, the Romans thought they could control him. They had no control over him. What Paul understood was that God was the warden of his life. And it doesn't matter where you find yourself along life's path. If you are a child of the king, God is the warden of your life. And learn to praise him no matter what you're facing, no matter what your difficulties are. Moving from verse 1 into verses 2 through 6 today. Uh, we're going to look at Paul the pioneer. Paul the pioneer. In our text verses, Paul begins to draw back the veil of a mystery, a mystery that God allows now the New Testament church to see that has been hidden in the heart of God for a long time. And now he gives it to Paul. And, and he tells Paul, it's your responsibility to make this mystery known. He wants the church to know that it's not an accident that God has given him this mystery. But that God, through his sovereign plan, has given him a message that he is to deliver to the New Testament church a message that benefits us still today. And I hope and pray that you're able to see that. Paul's words reveal him to be a pioneer in the early church because he preached a truth that had never been heard before. So I need to give you a couple definitions. I want you to uh, put this together quickly. A pioneer, by definition, is a person or a group that originates or help, helps open a new line of thought or activity or a new method. Now keep that in mind. Keep that definition in mind. We're going to look at Paul and the ministry that he was given. He says in verse 2, if you have heard of the dispensation of grace, of the grace of God, which is given to me for you. So we need to pull this. Let me unpack this a little bit. Dispensation, that word comes from a, a Greek word, oikonomia is the word, and it means administration or stewardship. So if we put our definitions together, here's what we have. Paul, the pioneer, is opening up a new line of thought, a new activity, a new method concerning something that he was given stewardship over when he uses that word dispensation. When Paul says that he was given a dispensation, he's talking about being given the oversight of taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Folks, praise God that pioneer Paul started preaching to the Gentiles, where would we be today? We would certainly not be here today if we had never heard that Christ died on the cross for sinners. Paul has been called to this special ministry, to make this mystery known. Paul says, and we're going to learn about this some today and a lot next week, Paul didn't choose this ministry for himself. God called him to it. Paul was tasked with telling the Gentiles about God's love, about
about God's salvation, about God's grace, and about the place that they have been given in the kingdom of God. Praise God, we've learned these things. Where would we be without that hope and without that message? But Paul says, I've been called to reveal this mystery to you. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 15 and 16, he says, Brethren, I have written more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Paul saying, I have been given a very specific ministry by God, and that ministry is to the Gentiles. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let me tell you, as I've said before, if you are not of Jewish descent, you're a Gentile. You're either a Jew or a Gentile. So when the Scripture speaks about the Gentiles, it's not speaking about a handful of uh, of Greeks or Romans, it's speaking about everybody down through all the ages who is not Jewish. You and I are Gentiles. And the message that God has for us through Paul in the Scripture is a message that is applicable to us today. He has spoken to us. He says, Brethren, I have written more boldly to you in some sort of putting you in mind because of the grace that is given unto me of God, that I should be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. On the day of Pentecost, what was promised unto us? It was the Holy Spirit of God. How can we say today that when we come to Christ in faith that, uh, that God lives in our heart? It's because the Spirit of God takes up residence. Praise God that there is a ministry and a message that when you come to faith in Christ, God Himself through His Holy Spirit's presence takes up residence in your life. That's why He can say, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. always tasked with telling people about God's love, about His salvation, about His grace. He didn't choose the ministry for Himself, as I said. It was assigned to Him by God. We read in 1 Timothy, Paul writing to Timothy this letter from a Roman prison. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. I can't wait to get to that one next week. But I want to tell you, Paul saying, look, this was not my plan. This was not my purpose in life. This is not what I was educated for. But you know what? On the road to Damascus, everything changed. And I want to tell you, there has to be a point and place in your life where everything changed. Where you said, by God's grace, I am not the man I used to be. By God's grace, I am the man he's directing me to be. Paul says, I was given this. Not, I didn't choose it. I was given it. He says in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 16 and 17, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. This is not my message, is what Paul's saying. And I want to tell you, that's a great filter through which to filter some of the mess you're hearing today as sermons. They're not sermons. If they don't preach that Jesus Christ died for sinners and that you're a sinner who needs to be broken and contrite before a holy God, their message might feel good, but it's not a message that's going to bring you to the throne of God. Amen. And I want to tell you, Paul says here, for though I preach the gospel, I don't have anything to glory of. This is not my message. This is God's message. And I stand before you today preaching God's message, yeah. not my own. He says, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. God made it necessary. Yea, woe unto me. If I preach not the gospel. At about 4.30 this morning in my wrestling with the devil, that verse came to me. And I said, God, I'm sticking with it. Woe well unto me if I don't preach the gospel. And Paul said, woe well unto me if 
I preach not the gospel. <clears throat> For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation, there's that word again, a dispensation of the gospel is committed to me. Paul says I've been given stewardship over a message that God has given for me to reveal to the New Testament church that heretofore had not even been revealed. Paul was compelled to preach the gospel because God had chosen him for that task. He had been given a dispensation of grace. It was his duty to faithfully preach the gospel wherever he went. Well, none of us have been called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Each one of us have been given a dispensation of grace. We've been given something that God says, I want you to be a steward of. And in many cases, my case, and yours, You've been given many things in the dispensation of grace. You've been given a spouse if you're married. You've been given children if God has blessed you with children and grandchildren. You've been given a church family. You've been given each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Your dispensation of grace and God wants you to be a good steward of that. The question is, what does your stewardship look like? We hear that word stewardship and we think it's just all about giving money. And there isn't any question that we understand the necessity to underwrite the work of the Lord. We have to keep the lights on. We have to keep resources available. We have to keep the air conditioner running, especially when it gets to be 106 outside. We need to do that. So there isn't any question that we have to underwrite what it takes to keep the church going. But stewardship goes beyond the money. God wants you to be a good steward of every dispensation of grace He has given you. And so how is your marriage? What's your relationship like with your children? How well do you interact one with another in the church family? And on and on I can go. The Lord gave each of us spiritual gifts, talents, abilities, knowledge, opportunities, your dispensation of grace. Your stewardship of God's blessing to you. How well are you handling and managing and overseeing those blessings. Paul says, God called me and gave me this ministry to the Gentiles. In 1 Peter 4.10 we read, As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards, of the manifold grace of God. Maybe I should read that again. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same to one another. You see, God is telling us in His Word that what He grants us by His grace, we are to be good stewards of. And that stewardship includes interaction and involvement one with another. Even so, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We all have a ministry, and it's our duty before God to fulfill that ministry for His glory. Let's look at Paul, the pioneer, and the mystery he was given. In verse number 3, the scripture says, Paul says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby you have read, uh, that you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known 
unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Again, without getting ahead of myself, let me say this first. When the Bible was canonized, when it was completed, it is all that we need. We do not need modern day, present day prophets trying to tell us that something was left out of the Bible or that somebody got a new revelation and they're going to build a whole um, religion on that revelation. When God got through speaking to John on the Isle of Patmos, it was done. It was complete. Amen. Keep that in mind as I move forward here. How by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. I move on. He talks about uh, which other agents was not made known unto the sons of men. What Paul is saying is, I have something from God, as do the other apostles, that was really unknown in Old Testament time. In Old Testament times, the focus was on the Jews and a coming Messiah. The Messiah came and they by and large rejected him. And God said, all along, the Messiah was not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. And that's the message Paul and the rest of the apostles have to preach. And that took place on the day of Pentecost initially and launched out from there. Paul makes it clear that he's been given a revelation of a mystery. The word revelation refers to an uncovering. God has now uncovered something that has been hidden. A mystery refers to a hidden thing. So it speaks of a, the secret counsels of God and things beyond natural knowledge that God has now laid on the heart of Paul, who writes um, exclusively about it, prolifically about it, but also the other apostles who helped take the gospel, as Jesus said, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. Praise God, the gospel made it to America. Because where would we be? Had this new mystery never been uncovered. But Paul says, Gentiles, I want you to know, Jesus loves you. And he died for you. And your sins can be washed away by his blood. You can be redeemed. You can be renewed. You can be reconciled. You can be restored. Because the blood of Christ washes away our sin. That's a, that's, isn't that a shouting moment right there? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So what Paul is saying is that God has lifted the veil away from a truth that had been hidden up until this time. What Paul had been writing about is a divine secret. It's a truth that was hidden from the ancient times. People like Moses and Abraham and David, and Isaiah and others did not possess this knowledge because God hadn't given it to them yet or hadn't given it to them in order and it become known to us. It was hidden from them in the secret counsels of God. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 3, God promised Abraham, in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And no one fully understood that truth until Paul was allowed to understand the mystery and write in Galatians chapter 3, in verse number 8, the scripture 
foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. Abraham wasn't sure what he was saying, what he was hearing. But Paul says, here we are at this critical moment now. Christ is risen, and he's gone back to heaven. And here's the good news. Even the Gentiles can be saved. Wow. Isaiah wrote this. He said, uh, it's a light thing that you should be my servant to raise up tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give you a light to the Gentiles. This in Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6. That you may be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Nobody fully understood that truth until the revelation of the mystery was given to Paul. And he explained it this way in Acts chapter 13. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. Chapter 13, verse 46 and 47, if you're trying to write these uh, reference verses down. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken unto you. He's speaking to a group of Jews. But seeing that you put it from you, that you rejected it, that you rejected the Messiah, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, we turn to the Gentiles. That's critical. The Jews rejected Christ, but Christ did not die in vain. And there will be a number of Jews that come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul says, we've shared this gospel with you, and you've rejected it because you don't think you're worthy of everlasting life. And so we are now taking this message to the Gentiles. He said, we turn to the Gentiles, for so hath the Lord commanded us. God has told us it's time to take the message outside the Jewish community and give it to the rest of the world. Praise God, it came to us. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light of the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. God is saying through Paul, that the message is going to go beyond Israel. It's going to all the earth. He's given Paul a special insight into a secret that had been hidden from the Old Testament, but is now evident in the New Testament. As I said, this was a revelation given to Paul that he wrote about. When the Bible was complete, there is no need for new revelation. We have all that we need in the Bible that God has given us. His word is in error, and it is sufficient. And I want to tell you that's the battle that we're finding today. Not so much the inerrancy of Scripture, but the sufficiency of Scripture. Let me tell you that God's word is sufficient. It's what we have, it's what he gave us, it's what we need, and we need nothing more. And we need nothing else. That's why Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, in verse 16 and 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, instruction in how we're supposed to live our life, so that the man of God will be completely furnished, that will lack nothing. Praise God for his work. Lastly, let's look at Paul, or pioneer Paul, and the message he was given. I touched on it a little as I talked about the mystery, but I want to focus here on verse number six, and then I'll be done. Verse number 
Verse number six said that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise by Christ or in Christ by the gospel. Now I've talked about salvation. I've talked about that being the mystery that Paul is revealing in his letter to the church at Ephesus much more detailed than in some of his other writings. I shared with you last week that you know they thought they had shut Paul up when they put him in prison. But God put him on the shelf for five years, took him off the mission field where he was going around starting churches, and that's great. We learned in those churches. We even read a few of his sermons. But the five years that he was in prison, we learned a ton of theology from his pen and all the epistles that he wrote to the churches that he planted. And today we benefit reading those epistles, reading those letters, because they're applicable to us today as much as they were applicable to the first century church. And after all these centuries, God's Word still applies. So we understand that he was given insight to the great mystery of salvation, but it goes a little farther, and that's what we read here in verse number 6, as we really look at the message the message that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. In both chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul's already touched a little bit on this mystery, but in this verse, he explains it more clearly. So what is the mystery that Paul has been given? The mystery is the good news that... The Jews and the Gentiles are one in Christ. Think about that. The Gentiles have been included with the Jews in God's plan of salvation to form His universal church to build the kingdom of God. Just before we went to Nashville, I preached a message about the building blocks of God's temple. And you know, I shared with you last week, but I want to rejoice again this morning. I said in that sermon, I don't know if God's going to put any stones in that temple here today. But I know in churches across the country and around the world, people are going to get saved and stones are going to be added to the kingdom of God. Y'all remember that? And what happened? Four children got saved Sunday. When I said, I don't think one of them, I don't think God's going to put one stone. God said, you're right, I'm not. I'm going to put four. <laughs> one of them was Torah. Two of them were the gross kids. And one of them was my granddaughter that we've been praying for. <laughs> called me that night. I'll call Grandma. And we can tell by the joy in her voice what she was going to tell us. I have one grandchild left that has not made a profession of faith in Christ. And I'm praying that God gets a hold of him. That's my prayer. And I want to tell you what a joy we're going to baptize all four of them. My granddaughter wants her other grandparents from Iowa to come, so we're going to do that probably in September. And within the next two weeks, we'll do the two gross kids. What a joy to see God add to the church. And that's what Paul was saying. Here's the great mystery. You guys, as Gentiles, are one with the Jews. That was not so much good news for the Jews because the Jews despised the Gentiles. They didn't want anything to do with them. The Jews did not allow fellowship with the Gentiles in any fashion. But the news that
the news that the Gentiles were waiting for a coming Messiah. They were waiting for a Savior. They were waiting for forgiveness of sin. They were waiting for someone to come and establish a kingdom. That's what they looked for. And I want to tell you as Gentiles, that's what we look for. We look for the same thing. We look for that Savior. Only we realize He's already come. But that He's coming again. And we look forward to that day when the trumpet sounds. And the dead in Christ shall rise. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. The scripture says that we are one with the Jews. We are one in the body of Christ. We are given the same blessings, the same privileges. The Bible says that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. In Ephesians 2 and 12, the, the Bible says, it tells us the Gentiles, that we were once aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of the promise having no hope and without God in the world. There was a time where the Jewish nation was the focus. That was the Old Testament. At that point, the Gentiles had no hope. They had nothing to look forward to. But now they possess the same legal standing as God's chosen people. We are all given the same blessing. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, the scripture said, Blessed be the Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us all, blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We are no longer strangers. We are no longer aliens. We are no longer outcasts. We are the sons of God. Amen. First John. Three and verse number one, the scripture says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. That just gives me Holy Ghost goosebumps right there. I have nothing to bring to my heavenly Father. I have a broken vessel. But our Heavenly Father has a way of putting a lump of clay on the potter's wheel and putting his hands on us and making us and molding us into a vessel fit for his use. Praise God. I am the Son of God. Through Christ Jesus. Scripture says that we are fellow heirs. I'll be done here in a moment. The Gentiles are of the same body. They are partakers of the same promise that the Jews have in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Just I'll share the verses with you. I'll push along quickly. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12 and 13. The Scripture says, For as the body is one and has many members, and all members of that body, being many, are of one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free. We have all been made to drink into one Spirit. The great mystery that Paul is now Putting the exclamation point on is the fact that we are one in Christ. And when we think about that, that we achieve the same standing, then what we understand is that there is no preference based on ethnicity. I'm not going to get into CRT much tonight, but I want to tell you the whole argument of CRT is that some people are better than other people, and so those people who are better or more privileged 
are holding down the ones that are less privileged. I want to tell you, we are all sinners before Christ. It doesn't matter what our ethnicity is. It doesn't matter what the color of our skin is. What matters is that we are sinners before a holy God and the Savior, the Lord Jesus, cleanses us and makes us holy, Amen. makes us clean. And so Paul says, you guys are one in Christ. Now listen closely. The reverse side of this is true. We are one in Christ. But Christ is in us as well. And that's what Paul is sharing. That's his message. You are one in Christ. Not only as a believer in Jesus, but because Jesus is in you. The Bible says in Colossians, it's a good verse to write down. If you haven't written any others down, write this one down. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 26 and 27. The mystery. Now this is Paul writing. He says, The mystery which has been hid from the ages and from the generations. The mystery that was unknown, he's saying in the Old Testament, but now is made manifest to his sins, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Amen. Glory, hallelujah. Amen. Christ in us. This, my friend, is a hallelujah moment. Not only can we come to Christ for forgiveness, but He forgives us. same Jesus who died on Calvary indwells the hearts of each person that comes to him in faith. When he moves in, he makes us part of his body. And he lives his life in and through each of us. The question you have to answer today are you in Christ, and is Christ in you? Here's what the scripture says, and then I'll close. John, the sixth chapter, verse 37. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. And him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Isn't that a great promise from our Savior? You come to me, and I'm not going to kick you out. I'm not going to say no. I'm not going to say go away. He says, I will in no wise cast out, for I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which has sent me, that all which he has given to me, I should lose nothing. Isn't it great to know Jesus ain't going to lose you? He's got you. He's got you in his hand, brother, sister, and he ain't going to lose you. I should lose nothing, but I will raise him up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life. And I'll raise him up at the last day. I praise God that one day the trumpet's going to sound. The graves are going to bust open. And we're going to meet him in the sky. Amen. Is Christ in you? Are you in Christ? Heavenly Father, thank you for this message. I trust, Lord, that it is a message that has resonated with the people. God, you have blessed us far beyond what we can ever, ever imagine. But we can be thankful. We can understand that everything we have comes from you. We have learned that we need to be good stewards of those things in which you have given us. So help us, Father, to process what we've heard, to respond as you might be laying it on our hearts. Lord, there may be some here today who needs this day to be a day of salvation for them. 
convict them and have them step out and come forward and let me share with them what your word says about the human child of the king. Others here who may be looking for a church home and you've laid it on their heart that this is the place you want them to settle in and to become a part of and to worship and to help with ministry. Lord, for those, would you have them step out this morning and come forward and make that known to us. Others who may be uh, distant from you in their life, and today they just need to come forward and ask you on bended knee at an old-fashioned altar to just ask you, Lord, to uh, renew the joy of their salvation, just like David asked after he was confronted with his sin. So God, whatever it is that you want to do, we give you this time, and we ask that you will work in a mighty, miraculous way. Your glory and honor. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing a song of invitation.